Uh, I don't know Terry. I've never met Terry until tonight, but I knew I knew when he, before he even got here I was going to like this guy because I'm kind of a climber. Um, he's a climber, obviously. A daunting but exciting story he's going to tell tonight. But it, what I like about stuff like this is it doesn't matter if you're a climber or if you go into the, the woods because you like nature, birds, bees, rocks, and fish, whatever. We all have that common interest, and that's why we're here. We're here to support public lands, wilderness, et cetera. And so uh, the social aspect of this is so exciting to get together and, and share passions about what brings us into the woods, what brings us joy, and, and um, why we all like to get out. It's healthy. How many went to the presentation last month with uh, Doug Chadwick? Yeah. Remember his talk about all the research showing how important it is to go out into the woods and good health. It's amazing stuff. So a little bit about Terry. Uh, he's a Montana kid. He grew up, he was born in Fort Benton, right? And uh, then moved to Columbia Falls. And his first climb of a peak was Tea Kettle, which, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a peak, but uh, then he later uh, began to climb in, in Glacier Park and was one of the pioneers of the, the technical climbing in uh, Glacier National Park. And that's kind of dear to my heart. I climbed a lot in Glacier, and I absolutely love it. Uh, he's also a bobcat from Montana State University. Go Cats! And uh, the grizzly talk was last month. So, um, and then he also went to the University of Puget Sound, where he got his master's degree. He was a physical therapist for many years. He's now retired, climbing full-time or something like that, right? <laughs> uh, he lives in Bozeman. Uh, he's climbed all over. He's climbed in the U.S., um, the Canadian Rockies, he's climbed in Alaska, the Yukon, and even in Nepal, which is pretty exciting. So uh, we're super excited to hear more about this fascinating story of the Mount Cleveland Five. And before I forget, uh, we do have books uh, for sale um, after the presentation, if you'd like. Uh, proceeds do benefit Wild Montana and, of course, Terry. So he's happy to sign your books afterward as well. So let's welcome Mr. Terry Kennedy. Well, this is a lot of people. <laughs> it's kind of daunting. <laughs> I haven't been in front of this many people in a long time. But uh, uh, so you'll probably have to forgive me. I'm going to have to stick with the map or I might get lost. And uh, so I'll probably read off of this a little bit. And then once we get into this slideshow, which hopefully will be about five or ten minutes from now, um, you know, the slides will kind of take care of themselves. So um, I just wanted to thank Chris for introducing me and for putting this together. And uh, several months ago, Hans Castron called me and said, hey, do you want to come up and do something like this? And I thought maybe it'd be just a little group of folks. And, and uh, so <laughs> this is pretty impressive. And, uh, and, and also Wild Montana and the Bob Marshall Wilderness Association and the Lookout Association for putting these things together. I think it's really awesome that, you know, there's kind of a uh, intermixing of, of associations here. And, and there's a lot that we do need to protect, of course. And so I'm very excited to be here to kind of share and perpetuate the, uh, the mountain lore, the, the stories that, you know, uh, get accumulated throughout the years and, you know, keep those stories active and, and alive. Um, so most of the uh, talk and presentation will not exactly follow that closely to the book, but just about everything I have to say or to show is mentioned or probably detailed in, uh, in the book. So in that respect, it does uh, uh, relate to the book. It isn't completely chronological. Sometimes I just kind of fit them in where it seemed like uh, it should be fit in. Uh, one thing I did is I put a lot of labels, uh, such as the people in the photo, the mountain that it's about, and the year, usually. So I won't have to ramble on and get sidetracked with that. It'll just go on its own. So a lot of the slides will be timed. Uh, there are dissolves and some other effects between slides, and then there are probably, I don't know, six or eight or nine slides that I'll pause on and maybe tell a story or just add some more details that take a little more time. So hopefully I can keep this under an hour and I'd really like to uh, you know, entertain questions that you might have uh, at the end. Um, it might be difficult to shout out a question from the back, but we'll, we'll try to move the mic around a little bit. 
And if that doesn't work, I'll certainly come up afterwards and uh, I'd love to hear a story or a question. I have a bunch of old gear over here for those, you know, gear junkies. Uh, the older climbers would probably like to look at it and reminisce and, and younger climbers would go like, man, you guys really use that stuff, you know? Uh, so you're welcome to come up at any point, you know, after the presentation and look at that. Um, I also have some relics that were retrieved off of Mount Cleveland. I, I think enough people have read the book, you kind of know uh, what, what came down. Uh, how many people were here and experienced, you know, that whole saga of, you know, early January to mid-January 1970? And, and remember reading about that in the newspaper here and on the radio. How many people? Yeah, yeah, quite a few. Um, were, was there anybody that was out of state that got word of this and kind of followed it? Uh, I know Mike Mansfield actually entered uh, something about this ongoing search uh, into the congressional record way back in Washington, D.C. Um, and actually somewhere have a copy of that, uh, of a letter he wrote to each uh, member of the family. So he was really personally involved. It was pretty, pretty special. Um, and so you're welcome to come up and look at, look at those. Uh, there's a new edition of the book out, and I'll hold it up. If you've bought it recently, you probably bought this copy. That's Jim Kessler on the front cover. The original version, which I actually don't have in my hand, but this is the same version with a little tagline on the front. But basically, the story is the same. The story has not changed. It just got kind of a, a new uh, facelift with this one, and we, I added a couple things in the, in the front matter. Uh, but it didn't change the story significantly. Uh, upgraded the epilogue, that sort of thing. So uh, if you have one of the older versions, it's, it's the same book. But if you want to get a new one, that, that's OK, too. And this is what's available now. There actually was a hardcover version, too. And, and uh, I have a few of those copies left, not with me. But uh, hopefully, they'll wind up in the library so they can get shelved. So um, I wanted to mention, also, there's other books written on this subject. Uh, the first one that came out was uh, in the year 2000 by McKay Jenkins called White Death. Anybody read that one? Yeah, it's, uh, it really chronicles the whole, you know, uh, initiation of the, uh, the search all the way to the recovery on the 4th of July, actually, was uh, the last recovery. So um, th that information is all very factual. Uh, in fact, I talked to McKay, and he kind of wrote something about our discussions at, towards the end of the book. But it's all kind of based on the Park Service report, which is about a 40-page report. That is through uh, uh, Freedom of Information available to you. They were pretty stingy about giving it out back for a certain period of time, but uh, I had a copy when I was 16 years old and pretty much had it memorized. So, I, you know, I fact-checked everything, so McKay's book is spot on. There's also a, a newer book out by Butch Lacombe, or Lacombe and uh, he was an editor for several uh, newspaper, uh, newspapers uh, over the years since he retired, but wrote, the, wrote this book, Montana Disasters, and I have read it, and it's just a series of uh, stories about everything from fires, forest fires, structural fires, avalanches, train wrecks, floods. It's pretty amazing. And, and I read it, and I thought, wow, this is really a good job. I mean, it is really delves into Montana history in a big way. And I was thinking every kid that graduated from high school should read that book, and then they know something about Montana. And he actually did put uh, a chapter in here, a section in here about the Mount Cleveland Five, so he thought it was serious enough to be included in that book, and he and I talked about it before his book came out, and we discussed it a little bit too. So um, let me just look here. Um, yeah, so as Chris said, I grew up in Columbia Falls, gradu graduated from high school in 1972, and I was actually a student at, at FBCC in 1986. I was gonna make a career change, hope to get into physical therapy school, and took some physics and chemistry here not on this campus, but when the campus was downtown in various <laughs> various buildings, you hear a lot of chuckles, you know, mostly in basements. And I have to tell you, I, I finished up my pre-physical therapy at the University of Montana, so I actually claim both universities as my alma mater. So I usually root for whoever has a chance to win the Big Sky Conference or or whoever's the head going into the fourth quarter. <laughs> so, but. The education I got here was every bit as good as the education I got at the University of Montana and then even Puget Sound, but that was that was a program, so it's a little different deal. But um, 
but it was very impressive uh, what I learned here, and uh, boy, what a good uh, value for uh, your educational dollar. So let's see if I lift anything out here. I think we've covered mostly everything. Far Country Press out of Helena is distributing the book, and it was the, uh, the remake of the, of the cover was done by Sweetgrass Books, and they're really kind of imprints of each other. Um, but it was kind of neat to be able to keep it in Montana. I'd gone through something online previously, but I was kind of the one-man band. They had to distribute it and everything, but now that's all taken care of, and, and it's going wider and further. So I think what we can do, let me see if I can get this and go, oh, it's already there. Um, so, you know, I'll bet you the mountains up in Glacier look a lot like that today. They certainly look like that on the way down the Swan and the missions in the, in the Swan Range. So as you can see, that is a webcam picture. I mean, imagine that, you think some famous photographer took that, but that's a, a webcam picture. So we're, I, I guess we're ready for lights here. And it might take me a, a few uh, attempts to figure this thing out, but when, once we get it going, I think uh, we'll be fine. And then I'm gonna try, let me just see if I got my laser. There we go, there are a few slides, so I'll probably point out a few things on the laser. Everybody can hear this okay, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> There's TKL in Columbia. Newman residents. I had all these people's, uh, you know, there's so many people from Columbia Falls in the stories, so I just wanted to point out that where this is, uh, you know, a very close knit community, and Mount Clemen is 40 miles to the uh, northeast there. So this all kind of got started with Hal Kanzler, I, I should think, and I remember seeing that slide. He had a, a telephoto lens mounted on a gun stock, and he took his kids out early. So this is gonna go pretty fast, but it kinda of has to. Can we get the lights down in the back? Is that possible? It looks like it's kinda of washed out here. Okay. So there's Monsignor Nicholas in 1963. That's Jim Emerson, also from Columbia Falls and the Council Brothers. And here they are as teenagers, and they did this massive cinema with Wilbur. So there's a picture of Citadel Spire by Hal Council. Unfortunately, it wasn't cleaned up too much. It's one of these, you know, 55-year-old slides that accumulated dust a little bit. It wasn't through the fall of Hal Council, but probably more of my, my fault. I've had it for a while. So, and some of these slides are pretty dirty. You'll see a lot of debris uh, stuck to the emulsion. It's really hard to get off of there. But for the book, we photoshopped all those out for the photos that are in the book, and then they were converted to black and white. And I have to thank Steve Jackson, who is a curator uh, the Museum of the Rockies, and also a climbing partner who was on the North Face of Mount Cleveland with me too, that did all that technical stuff, and it wouldn't be the same without his efforts. So Hal Kanzler took this photo of Citadel Spire. It's up on the American end of uh, Waterton Lake. And in 1966, Jim had uh, graduated from high school in Butte after moving to, from Columbia Falls to Butte in 1965. And they were kind of on a roll, and Hal knew that the boys were real interested in stuff like this and the North Face of Mount Cleveland. And I was able to unearth this note that Hal sent to Jim Kanzler when he asked his dad to send him some pitons because he was going to start getting after it in 1966. So here's the note. <laughs> yeah, a little foreshadowing maybe. Uh, I think this slide changes on its own. Here we go. So this is a little bio on, on Hal. It'll change on its own. Yeah, there we go. Jim Kanzler with his hot rod. And this is Butte. There's Claire Pagreeb on the right and, and Ray Martin on the left. So this is the one I'll stop on. So this is a picture of Jim Kanzler. I'm not sure you took the photo, probably Jerry Kanzler. And um, this is probably in the humbug somewhere, but I don't know if you can see this well enough in detail, but he's got a lot of old timey stuff on there. He's doing a rappel. Anybody remember the brake bar that you put, you cross loaded the carabiner with and, and braked on? I don't know if they had fatalities with that or not, but they, it didn't last very long because it was really a bad idea. But that's what he's got there. Uh, 
because those carabiners cross-loaded don't hold a lot of weight, and I, you know. But anyway, he's got, this is an old rock piton, and I, and, uh, I know a guy in the audience, Greg Olson, has one of these too, and he's yeah, the same uh, genre as I am. And he used to get these for a buck ninety-five at REI in Seattle. They're just in a bin. You go in there for a buck ninety-five, and you have yourself a rock hammer. Uh, here are some old atriers, uh, aid slings, and so they were dabbling with with aid. Um, and this is probably circa nineteen sixty-six. I'm guessing probably in the fall. And you know, a whole bunch of uh, whoops. I, let me let me go back to that for a second. So he's got a. Uh, whole bunch of one-inch tubular webbing slings there. And honestly, I don't know what that is. It looks pretty scary, but that's kind of a twisted nylon rope. And I hope he was just taking that home to throw it away. But, uh, but this is how they learned. They were self-taught. They, they taught themselves rock climbing when they got to Butte starting in 1965. And then eventually, they kind of went viral. They went to the Tetons, went to Yosemite, and, and you know, we eventually you know, got into the Canadian Rockies and Glacier, but you know, um, Let's see what we got here. I mean, look at that, uh, hiking boots basically on granite. They've never been on granite before. Here's a picture of Jerry, he's probably 12 or 13 years old there. <coughs> it's probably called Our Tower near Butte. Phil Antonoli's dad was a doctor in Butte. And I'm sorry, these are going by a little fast, I think, but we'll get there. That was Claire Pagriba in sneakers. And Claire was a real driving force. Um, he had a lot to do with this. That's on the International on the way up to Goat Hunt when they did uh, Citadel Spire and they had a whole bunch of guys from Montana Tech with them that hiked in with them. That photo was actually in Summit Magazine year, a year later. And then they went on to bigger and more horrific looking things and so that's North Face of Cleveland and that's North Face of Cleveland in the winter from the air. That probably is about what it looked like back in 1969, just after Christmas. So this photo came off recovered pictures that were on Jim Anderson's camera. Jim Anderson grew up in Big Fork, and he was 18 years old, and his film survived in the camera. I think he had a little film that was also uh, ro rolled up and and uh, survived, they found it, you know, in, in its canister probably, you know, the little plastic thing. And so here they are, that's North Face of Cleveland, and I'm not sure exactly where it is, but I think they're traversing up to the Northwest Ridge from there. If you could look at it further back, I'd be able to tell exactly what part we were looking at. But here they are traversing out, um, and they had a base camp below the North Face, uh, they went up and recon the North Face. I know that Jim Anderson, Jerry Camsen went very far up that cooler in the center of the face, which is the route we began on and other subsequent ascents uh, have followed also. And I think that's probably further back in the uh, photograph. But you'll notice the damage to the film. It's got a light leak there. It's got water damage. That might even be a little bit of, uh, um, let's see if I can get this thing going. There it is. That might be a little bit of mildew or something like that because it, it did get wet. Now this picture is what the old book cover was composed <laughs> off of. And I have to tell a story on this a little bit. That's North Face Cleveland, the background that was taken on the way in in 1976. So we're approaching the face. We photoshopped this picture of Gary Kanzler off of another photograph. But the problem was that he was kind of cut off at the feet and I tried to get a couple of artists to draw in the rest of the boots, and they said, uh-uh, it wouldn't, it wouldn't look right. So what we wound up doing, to make a long story short, is we used a pair of Jim Kanzler's boots. Jim was deceased by then, uh, and these are a pair of Cassinger Peter Hablers that I have in a box up, up here, and they're unique because the insole is made out of hardwood. Um, and it's starting to do laminate a little bit. So Steve Jackson, you know, did a lot of the technical work here, and he says, you know, it's not going to look right it just taking pictures of boots and putting them in there. So I wound up wearing the boots, got in this position, and they got photoshopped on, and they don't look too bad, actually. Now, I have to confess that this rock was not from Glacier Park. That rock is, uh, is granite, or nice, a nice rock that's a Pilot Canyon. I don't know if anybody is familiar with practice rock, but it's essentially 
granite. And I went up there and took a whole bunch of photos and we tried to find something that would kind of fit that position. So that's what happened and then the book cover got added onto it and all the rest of it. That rope, by the way, is pretty much the, the true color of the rope that he was on. He was attached to Ray Martin when they found him. And I have seen that rope a long time ago, but I don't know where it is. The Park Service returned everything they recovered to the families. But that's why the book cover, the tile is in red. It was trying to match that red rope. Uh, so it was a fully 11 millimeter rope. I think it was probably only a 150. Let's see here. Just a collage of some of the newspapers. This one is from the Spokesman Review. That's a male rooter photograph. Boy, the park really liked having that. I think Jim Anderson was probably very, very strong climber. There he is on the summit of Cleveland. Climbed Mount Cleveland twice before the Cleveland tragedy. Let's see if I can stop this for a second here. I don't know. Hopefully, I get it back on. I just wanted to say that. Um, some of the effects are a little different. I, I programmed it, I, I built a slideshow on a Mac, and this is a PC, and it took, you know, the, the IT guru a little working to get this back up. So all these little checkerboards are usually dissolves, but I guess I'm the only one that'll appreciate the difference. Um, let's see if I can go back one here. There you go, there's Claire Pagreeva. I think Jerry Kanzler may have taken that picture in one of his, uh, some of his coursework. You know, they were buried side by side. It's another male rooter photo. So there's Pat Cowles, who's very instrumental uh, in the search. He's the one that actually made the first discovery of a pack in the snow. Everybody thought they'd be in the north face, but they were actually on the west face kind of an interesting story that I outlined in the book. They were trying to sequester them away from where they thought they would find them, as it turned out. Uh, Pat Callis in this photo, Jim Kanzler, and Peter Lev got relegated to the West Face, and that's where they wound up finding them. Um, so this is Pat Callis, probably a full year later, probably the winter of 70-71, uh, and, and Pat, in, in this picture, is probably 30 years old, maybe 31, and he still is a professor of uh, chemistry and biochemistry at MSU. In fact, he got the Regents Award awarded to him, uh, Professor Regents Award, which is super high honor to be in the in the university system. But anyway, here he is climbing, and he was really an innovator with the the new ice gear. Um, I think these crampons have been out for a couple of years. Claire Pagreva had a pair, but here's the new design of the ice axes. Uh, prior to here, and even during the Mount Cleveland. Uh, uh, epic, the pips on the ice axes were all straight. You couldn't make them stick in the ice because they just came right back out. It was like sticking a nail in it and the nail comes right out. So the pick was curved and it was designed by Yvonne Chouinard and Tom Frost. And uh, I've got a couple uh, variations of that up here on the table if you want to check them out. They were either made with hickory or laminated bamboo. I had a 70 centimeter axe that was laminated bamboo and that's in a, yeah, another little museum thing somewhere. So I, I borrowed uh, another one to bring here. But you can see back in those days for you people that have been uh, climbing, that the ice goose there, you had to stop, you had to chop a starter hole and begin to twist them in with an alpine hammer or an ice hammer that had a little bit smaller pick than the ice axe. And it took, I don't know, 10 or 12 cranks to get it going. And, and that's a lot of time to spend in one place. So um, the 70 centimeter axe, I've talked to modern climbers that tried to do maybe this climb with those tools and they just freaked out. And honestly, compared to the new tools, it's like swinging a telephone pole. And it, it takes, it's very tiring. So anyway, I actually did this route earlier this, uh, this year, you know, a month ago. and. Uh, with all the modern tools, and I was plenty gripped doing that. So, um, 
So that's a peak. I was rafting off of a spire in, in the Humbugs and went by that piton and snapped a photo of it. I'm sure that's from the 60s era. So this photo was in the back of the book, um, all, all the editions. A Jim Anderson photo again. You can see light leaks and water damage. And that's a picture of them traversing. They're actually on the west face now, but they're going to go around this corner and up the big uh, the basin or the big kind of parabolic mirror, as Bob Prosson called it. And the very last picture in the slideshow will show that quite well. It looks like about a half pipe that you would snowboard or, you know, free ski down. But anyway, so this is probably Jerry Kanzer in the lead, and I think this is Ray <coughs> Martin. I think that's Martin Levitan. And here is uh, Claire Pagriva. Claire Pagriva was five foot two in mountain boots. And look at the size of this pack, and I know darn good and well that's a, that's a, an 11 millimeter rope, and they lug those babies all the way to the summit. And I, I that, so I'm getting ahead of myself a bit here. I have a working hypothesis that they actually did summit, and I'll show you why I think so later. But uh, they, they were really working here, and they were exercising a certain amount of caution because below here is just this big, you know, um, kind of a snow field. Probably gets slabbed up. I, this is probably would be scary to cross right at this moment, but they're going for it. And uh, you can see they had to break a lot of trail. But they're going up at the base of the rock and trying to stay above most of the slab that's down here. And it just funnels into an hourglass or what we climbers call a hell hole. So it, it's a train trap. Uh, and I guess they were just darn lucky under the conditions they had to, to get past that. And that's. Um, Stone Indian Peaks in the background there. Okay, now here's a picture that I, I really think they bivouacked on the face. Uh, and if they did, their sleeping bags are still down in, in, their, uh, in the base camp. Uh, because when they recovered the base camp, they had five <coughs> sleeping bags in it. So here they are, probably about the 7,200 foot level, either taking a calorie break or calling it a day. It could have been late enough in the day that were, you know, the shortest day of the year practically, you know, five o'clock, it's, it's dark, and you better find the, a place to, to <laughs> alight before then. And I went up, uh, I've done this, been through this area a couple times. I, I wish I would have put my photograph in there because it matches right up at this cliff. Of course, it was in the summer. But uh, uh, I think they actually bivouacked here, and I'll, sh I'll show you why in the next slide. <coughs> Take a look at this. There's an ice axe back here. And uh, I've never seen anything like it. And a couple of years ago, I got some tips and I was able to track a guy down in Bend, Oregon that has that ice axe. And I bet none of you have seen anything like it. I'm kind of wondering if it wasn't an uh, army issue because Mark Levitan's dad was in the 10th Mountain Division. And, but let's go to this slide next. This is why I think they bivouacked. Those are the uh, 8,000 foot peaks, lesser peaks across uh, the Waterton Valley, and this was obviously taken on the west face. That's Camp Creek down in here, um, and the west face, you know, they're just going around the corner where you saw them traversing there. I mean, you'd have to be up there at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I don't think they got like a, you know, 2 a.m. start to get up there. I think they bivouacked there. So they must have been pretty haggard by the time they uh, moved further up the mountain. So here's that ice axe. I've never seen anything like it. Now this photo is in the algal reef, the fossil algal reef, that, and I'll show you a picture of it from afar here in a minute. That, that is, uh, it's probably at least halfway up the bowl. You'll be able to see it, decide for yourself. It's, it's quite a ways up there. It's probably over 8,500 feet up there. And it's a long ways from the top, but it's a long ways from the bottom too. And uh, yeah, this looks fairly technical, really. I mean, uh, I think it's probably short and they elected not to rope on it, but it's low in the mountain. And you can see that that is not the same ice axe. This may be the ice axe that is shown in uh, McKay Jenkins' book, White Death. Remember, he, there was a picture in there where the ice axe was broken. They found part of it, part of the ice axe in May or June of 1970. And about two or three years later, another ranger just making a recreational climb of the West Face found the other half of the ice axe and the two pieces fit together. There's a photo of it in McKay's book. So this is a photograph by Brian Kennedy uh, of uh, 
Glacier Monterey Society, and also the editor of the Hungarian News for 20 some years. He's uh, succeeded uh, uh, Mel Ruder taking over the Hungarian News, and he's a renowned mountaineer in, in and of himself. So, this was taken from across the valley. So, here's the North Face. I would say the base camp is at the base of the North Face, something like here. They came up the North Face Basin onto the Northwest Ridge, and we'll see a little bit more of that in another photo. And then you traverse over here. That picture of all five of those guys traversing was under this cliff, and then you emerge out onto the West Face. So the Algebra Reef is this thing right here. Sorry, I can't hold this thing anymore still in that. Uh, it's a long ways away, I guess. But uh, you'll see the Algebra Reef in another photo too, and it's not very high, it's probably, I don't know, 30 feet, 40 feet, I don't know, not, not real high, but it's a long ways up the mountain. But the point is, they weren't roped up here. And I, I went up, I've done this route twice now, uh, once later in the year when it's dry, and the easiest way up the west face, and you'll see this from another perspective later on, is to go out here and you drop down slightly. Later in the year, the snow is pretty much gone, so it's dry, and you can go up through this cliff band, then you kind of work up through here. Whoops, sorry, you work up more through here and get to the summit ridge, and then it's pretty much hands and pockets to the top. Um, that's really significant. Um, this is the last cliff band, and it's kind of bisected and overlapped a little bit. You'll see that in another view. I always thought they probably took the easiest line in, in the winter to go up here, but uh, I, I didn't get the photos quite matched up, so I, I wasn't sure. So I think what probably happened is they went up here, and I do think that they summited because uh, in a, another photo in uh, a couple of frames from now shows this cliff band uh, in Alpenglow. They're on their way down and they're like 20 minutes, uh, you know, from it being pitch black. So let's see what we got next year. Okay, so here's, you know, another Anderson photo. There's Claire Pagriba, they're staying in the, in the same lineup. So there's Claire. That's Ray Martin, and I have the feeling Jerry Cans have just disappeared over the top of this chunk of rock there. This isn't really hard terrain. Uh, it, you know, this would be pretty easy to scramble through in the summer, but they're roped up, and I think the reason they're roped up is for two reasons. One is it's windy, and you probably couldn't hear this guy from the person that took the photo, Jim Anderson, so they very wisely roped up to keep the team together. Mind you, they probably spent a night out without sleeping bags, and now they're trudging up this thing, and probably not everybody's wearing even, and uh, they very wisely kept the, the, the group together, and probably in high winds. It doesn't really look at high winds, except for it looks like the fabric on, on Claire's pants are kind of pressed in against his, uh, his body there. And, but they are still punching through us. So it's not complete, you know, concrete sestrugia, it's somewhere in between. Um, and uh, so, anybody want to take a guess of what time of day this is? I mean, I look, if they're facing due east and the camera, is, the back of the camera is due west, that's late in the afternoon, right? At least three o'clock, maybe more like four. And I looked at this with some of my buddies who've been in the, in the park a lot, and I said, look at, it's three or four in the afternoon and they battled all their way up this thing and the top at the skyline, there's 10,000 feet, and you can put your hands in your pocket and walk to the summit. Do you think they went to the top? Probably so. So, um, so either they're right here, or I'll try to hold this more <coughs> still, or right there. And it, it was just a short ways to get to the top. So here is the next photograph. That's the last discernible frame of, of the rolls. And it's taken looking up at, I think, the right side. And this is almost, I think the split, the overlap occurs right in here. And so they're probably maybe 1,000 feet, 800 to 1,000 feet below the top, but they're way over, kind of directly below the summit, or at least closer to that. And I, I'm not sure if that's the same frame or if it's another one and it actually connects up. And then I, I don't know what, what happened here. But, um, Here's another Brian Kennedy photograph taken from the far right side of, of Mount Cleveland. This is in 2008, and Brian and I were trying to keep up with Don Sharp as he got to the, the top here, and a group of uh, 
uh, uh, glacier mountaineers went up there. And th so this is from the rib looking over at the face. So my leading hypothesis is they probably came up through this grunge, uh, maybe a little further over here, and then the easiest way to the last cliff mount is probably right here. I think that's where that photo was most likely taken. I need one more trip back up there, take a picture and see if it matches up. But that last photo that was, you know, just kind of mixed up with some other parts of the film was probably taken from here, looking at this rock right here. So here's what I think happened. This is my leading hypothesis, and it, you know, it's just a hypothesis at this point. But I think what happened, they had 20 minutes of daylight when they got to there, and they're all roped together, and they're probably really trashed. And, they, and it's night, and I don't think they want to go down through this terrain all roped up with the dark. I think what they did probably is traversed over on the ledge and got into this stuff because you could descend that snow uh, all the way down into the basin at night. It wouldn't be too hard to do and you might be able to plunge that, you might be able to glissade. Um, and so at this point, what I'd like to do, so Pat Callis, getting back to Pat Callis, he was on the, uh, on the search team on the west face. Uh, we've discussed this many times, but this is in an email and it's something I could read and it's just a sentence or two, but it really sheds a lot of light on this. So he said they could look up and they could see the crown fracture of the, of the avalanche. They didn't really know that it linked up, that these guys were actually in it. Everybody thought they'd be on the north side. But um, let me just see if I, uh, how close are you to the lights over there? I'm right here. Okay, just, just a little bit or whatever you can give me. So I'll read this. I don't quite have it memorized, but so here's so this is this is the uh, the bowl of the west face. So what would be the left side is over here, or the north side of the bowl, and the south side of the bowl is just kind of over this lip. And we'll see a big photo of that later. But Pat Callis said, yeah, they could see the, the crown of the avalanche, and it took them a while to figure out that it's like this is it. And uh, he wrote in his email, he says, I've always retained a picture that they were near the south end of the face. So that would be the right-hand side of the face. That would include this. And he said, maybe Bud, that would be Bud Anderson, it's Jim Anderson's brother that flew by the peak. If you've read the book, you, you, you know what we're talking about here. And uh, you know, he said, maybe he showed me a picture. I don't, Bud was f flying solo, I believe, and, and somebody can correct me on this if, if that doesn't seem right, but he flew by the face just to check on him. And, and he thought that, you know, they'd wave to him from the base camp or maybe on the mountain somewhere, but he saw the avalanche and he said he thought he saw tracks leading into the avalanche, but he also said he thought he saw tracks leading out of the avalanche. But there's always a question whether they were goats or whether they were climbers. But uh, Pat said it looked to him like the tracks came straight down, like maybe somebody had glissaded and then the tracks ended at the crown of the avalanche. Well, they undoubtedly set it off, whether it, it happened over here or whether it happened over here, but where they were later recovered, uh, d during the search when Pat, Peter, Levin, Jim Counselor were up there, Jim told me, he said, we walked right over the top of them and never even knew they were there because they were down pretty close to the bottom. But they had 300 feet of rope stretched out and not one loop of rope was on the surface. I mean, how do you get that much snow? So I think they probably were coming down this, and here's a roll in the terrain where a lot of times you, they'll trigger, and they might have been coming through here and triggered it, and the crown was up in here, and then you had all of this, which is a lot more than what's in this view, come down on you, and then they couldn't find it. And that's, that's what took a long, a long time to uh, sort out. So if you're in the, the basin, after you finish the traverse, you're out here in, whoops, let's go back. Um, it's a good thing this says reverse on it. Whoops, that isn't a reverse. So this is the easiest way, when it's dry at least, to you wander out into the bowl. You can scramble up this stuff. I did it uh, a couple of years after that when it was all snow and, and used uh, an ice axe and crampons and, you can sneak around here, then you get up into this stuff, and it's all stable in June, except for maybe rockfall. But it was really cold, so I was okay. And then I was a hoax to traverse way over here and see if I could determine whether they went through that rock band. 
But the easiest way to get up is through here, and I don't know if uh, Jim Anderson and his partners, you know, climb this way, but you can see off the left side, it gets kind of gnarly, and I don't think it's quite as bad out over in here off the photograph, but if it's dark and you're really tired and you think you can get over here and just go save and, and plunge step and of course this would all be snow and get back, that's probably the decision you'd make. That's probably the decision I would make. Let's see, so I think we went to a black slide and then the Kennedy brothers appear. Okay, right, so this is Bedrock Canyon. There's the railroad tracks, that's Key Kettle in the background and that's Dan looking over at the North Base in 1971. And of course that little vignette's in the book too. Um, so this is 1974 in the days of wall and here's just a few rock climbing shots in the you know, Humbug Spires area. Actually that one's Gal Canyon. We can tone the lights down again too if you want. I don't think I'll freak you out. That photo was in the book. And this is Jim Emerson from Colony Falls too, <clears> one of these <throat> lifelong partner. Here we are racking up to climb something in the Humbug. So Brian Leo and Doug McCarty, um, just Montana famous climbers actually, and they're mentioned in the book. Gosh, I, I, I should probably see if I can stop up oh, there, won't let me land on it. So we traversed across this rock, and when we were coming up the north side, this is what we climbed over, and we went, oh my God, I'm sure glad that thing stayed put. <laughs> so that's uh, Silver Pillar and the Beartooth, Brian Lee and I did that right on the left, and this is a warning. It took a bad fall, <laughs> but it wasn't quite as serious as it looks, as it looks like. I'm here at least. <laughs> so we get to St. Nick, and that's where Steve Jackson and I did. There's Steve on there. He's 19 when we did this, so he's pretty young. And that's the summit of St. Nick. So that kind of prepared us for Cleveland, and Steve took this picture at the base of the North Face. And that's what it looks like from the Northwest Ridge. I, I really love that photo. It says clouds on the top and clouds underneath. Jim always referred to that as the Big Daddy. And here's a few pictures from the North Face climb. Let me tell you, that's his Part of pictures that I've ever seen led in, in the mountains. Wasn't that technically difficult, but it sure was scary. That's where he knocked over the refrigerator sized rock, and that's on the summit. And by the way, that platform we're standing on, it ain't there anymore. <laughs> I, I can't imagine where it went. <laughs> so th this deserves a little bit of a story here. So I was going through Yellowstone Park with my wife Diana and my daughter Lindsay probably 10 or so years ago. And we're just doing, you know, checking out all the sites. We went through this parking lot, Diana's driving, and I said, hold it, stop, I gotta go get my picture taken. Can you figure out from this what, what this is? There, there's a clue right here. It's one of those red motorhomes where they have these great panoramic photos on there. And I said, I want my picture taken here because I, I climbed this, this face, and we didn't have very many good pictures of it because we walked to the bottom Bobby, the face, it was dark, and we started up at first light, and we were just gripped all the way. I'll show you the next photograph here. Um, this is a real picture. That, that's the north face of Delta Form, so if you go up to Moraine Lake near Lake Louise and look at the Valley of the Ten Peaks, I think this was number eight, Delta Form, eight or nine, I can't remember, but Dexter took us a year or two later, and the route goes up to this, and then this cliff band is really hard and honestly we couldn't make a good assessment of the face because it was it was dark when you got in there and by the time we got to here you'd look up and all you see is rock and it looked okay we checked in at the wardens earlier and they we knew a storm had gone through there a summer snowstorm and they said that's ah, not that much and I said how much is that much are we talking millimeters or are we talking meters and he says oh just meters <laughs> I mean just just millimeters just millimeters sorry and so Dex and I got up here and the sun hit the face and this was just a bowling alley. We had to take cover over in here for about four or five hours and wait for the sun to get off the face for the rock fall to quit. And looking back, we, we sh never should have been up there at that period of time, but we kind of got fooled into going up there. And we did a bivouac right here. We, we climbed up to here 
and it was like 10 or 11 pitches to there, and it was like 11 or 12 pitches up to there, and we were just trashed. We left at 3 o'clock in the afternoon from Glacier. I was doing my seasonal ranger gig up there at that time, and we drove up there, started hiking, and we thought we'd get a couple hours of shut-eye down in here, but it was getting late before we even got to there, and we had to hurry up and get on there, so we had climbed, we'd been away for, I don't know, I can't do the math on this anymore, but from 3 o'clock to 3 o'clock to 7 or 8 o'clock, and then we, we cut it a little close, so in the morning we barely had enough fuel to fill our water bottles, and we didn't get a hot drink in us, and I, uh, Honestly, you may not look like it from here, but it took six hours to climb this pitch right here. I mean, there are two pitches, about 200 feet, and it was just, you know, as, as epic as I've ever done. So we finally topped out. We did go to the summit. We came down. We weren't moving very fast. Did a couple of repels off the other side, which is one of the normal descent routes. We have whacked without any, well, we probably melted some ice or something like that with body heat. But we didn't have anything to eat, and the next morning we got down and a storm came in and socked the whole range in, and we were getting soaked within an hour, and we bailed out to the other side of the mountain because we couldn't see the mountain to you know, do the whole long traverse way over here somewhere. So it, it was just a survival decision, and we did a few repels, got down to this lake, and walked down this trail for, seemed like forever. We didn't know where it would come out. And uh, about noon the next day, or you know, that day, Later in the afternoon, we could hear the helicopter flying with that. They're looking for us. And they found us way down here somewhere, and they landed on a gravel bar. And we knew they were looking for us, so we said, you know what, this is such an epic, just a, you know, a, a survival effort and getting up and off this thing in one piece, that we decided we refused the helicopter ride, so we did. And the guys got out and they said, wow, how was it? And we went, oh man, you know, we shouldn't have been up there. And he said, yeah, it looked terrible. You know, and the helicopter was putting away on the other side of the creek, and this guy is all decked out, ready to go. He's come talking to us. He says, "Yeah, we looked at the whole face. We couldn't see our tracks, but then we found him down there in that, and you know, in this basin over here. Let's let's go back in this uh, basin over here." And he says, "Well, you guys signed up. You know, I mean, good for you." He says, "If you want, we'll give you a ride to your car." He says, and we looked at each other and kind of doing double takes and. And we decided, no, we'll walk out. He says, well, it's 40 miles from here. <laughs> but we walked out anyway. And the only reason I think we made it down, it was a Radium Hot Springs Highway before we came out. I mean, we didn't walk 40 miles. But, you know, it was 40 miles of all the way around the Horn to get to where we'd started. And uh, we probably would not have made it. We probably would have died of exhaustion, except we found a trail crew camp, a real uh, uh, well-established Canadian Rockies trail crew camp, but it was Sunday and there was nobody there and we were starved. And we just thought we'd get in there and find some food, but they very wisely had all their food sequestered away from grizzly bears and we're going, I can't find anything. You know, and Dexter is Mr. You know, uh, polite. And he says, I don't think we should do this. They said, are you kidding me? You know, <laughs> and, and I said, what's in these boxes? And it broke open a box and it was cases of Canadian beer. <laughs> And I, I went, oh boy, here we go. And so we started popping open beers, and Dexter said, I don't think we should be doing this. I said, Dexter, if you were one of those guys, and he took a look at us, don't you think you'd offer us a beer? And he goes, well, yeah. So we were good for a little while, and eventually <laughs> made it back. And we got a ride back to our car, and you know, the rest was, was even worse. We had, the worst bailwack was in the car on the way home, actually. But, <laughs> So here's one of the few pictures of Super Coolar. And I look at that now and I thought, man, what in the heck were we doing up there? So here's Dexter. I'm sorry, these are going a little faster than I thought they would. But that was in the Canadian Rockies. And these are some really good pictures by Dexter. I wish I could hold on this, but if I, if I shut it off, and maybe I will. That, that last picture is taken in 2019 with Dexter climbing. A pretty cool route up Highlight Canyon called the Good Looking One. And, uh, decked out in all the modern gear, and Dexter is, is really a fabulous ice climber, and he was one year post bilateral hip replacements in that photo. And I was two weeks before my bilateral hip replacements. <laughs> <laughs> Hence he was leading. Uh, but, uh, so this, this is a quick jump over to Denali, you know, going back to 1984. 
and I think I pause on this one too, but so if people are familiar, this is the uh, south face of Denali. This is the Czech route that's become a world test piece, which I have not done, nor will I jump on. This is Big Bertha, and so we're climbing up, uh, still on skis, and climbing up, and we're gonna go around and do the south buttress. So there's a big loop in this route to follow the glaciers, and this is about 12,000 feet. And we're skiing, but I'm carrying an ice axe for self-arrest, just in case we drop into a crevasse. There's four guys in two rope teams of two. I think that's Dan probably behind me, and I think Tom Kluge was probably took his photograph. But does anybody know the name Muck Stump? Does that ring a bell with you climbers? You know, um, he, he died a few years after this, right about where this photo was taken. He fell into a crevasse. And, uh, you know, he was roped up, but he was guiding, and he brought some climbers down there, and the climbers got, you know, flocks by this crevasse, didn't know what to do with it, and he says, let me come down and look at it, and he went and took a look at it, and he fell, and he went to the length of the rope, and they couldn't get him out. So, this is a beautiful photo, I'm sure it was, you know, Tom Kladuas, this is Mount Hunter, right there. We're way above Mount Hunter, and there's a cool little someone shot. So this should have dissolved a little more slowly. I'm gonna go back to this. Um, so there's Doug McCarty, and I can't stop it. So that was Doug McCarty in the Wind River Range on a route called the East, I think it's called the East Face of Pingora. Just a fabulous grant climb. It takes all day to do it. And this is in the Bridger Range. That's Pat below the North Face, and it's just an amazing uh, limestone climb. It's all bolts. And it's just fabulous climbing. Um, not too hard. So this is all the way over to Yellowstone Park. This is Maurice Horn of uh, Teton's Renown, taken in 2005, so not that long ago. And this is a Beathar out here. And you get to it, we have bushwhack and root found and scrambled all the way up to this point for 3,000 feet. And here's the West Ridge. And the, and the West Ridge is two miles long. And you kind of, past this thing and then you get onto real knife edge and you go way back here and you climb up over here and there's kind of a plateau and you get to the summit. And it was just touch and go as you can see by this next picture. It's a little bit exposed on both sides of the ridge. Horrible rock. I would take Glacier Park rock over this stuff any day. And uh, so we would go along and it's like I don't know if we can go any farther. And we went let's, let's check on the other side and went oh it goes over here. And we were just going back and forth over the ridge. I think we made about the fourth ascent of this thing from what I can gather. Actually, to tell you the truth, we made the fourth and the fifth ascent. I'll show you why. So here we are on the summit plateau. We're coming down. This is Maurice and he's gonna drop over here and we go down there and it's like, we have to go back. And it was just about the same way going back as it was coming up. So we thought, hey, we did this thing twice. And honestly, this is the best climb I've ever done that didn't require a rope. I mean, if you're really adventuresome and you want to go in there, you should do this. And, you know, don't take gear, I mean, if you're confident. And uh, if you take gear, it'll take you forever, and the blaze won't be any good anyway. So, um, so where that first picture was taken was over on this shoulder, right over here. This is Soda Butte Creek and you wind your way around uh, a Beathar, around behind it, and you come out over here on the wall somewhere, and this is the northeast entrance, and Silver Gate, and uh, Cooksuit over here, and then Beartooth Highway goes out over here somewhere. And so this is a Lamar Valley, let's, let's go back, <laughs> that's right. Uh, go back one more. So just for perspective, the Lamar is out here somewhere, and this is Soda Butte Creek. So if you're familiar with Yellowstone, now you can kind of put it into perspective. So this photo uh, was kind of a rare photo that somebody else took. Unfortunately, it was at uh, Rob Hart's memorial service. He was probably the only guy to ever get killed on Red Lodge Mountain, and it was probably just a freak accident. He was the guy that invented Crazy Creek Chairs. And so Jim and I uh, did a climb with him. I'll show you that in the next slide. But this is Chad Chadwick, who's really the uh, you know, the champion of the Beartooth. He's a guy who got technical uh, rock climbing going in the Beartooth, and he and Jim are really good partners, and Chad's just a wonderful guy, still lives in Billings, and still climbs hard. And that is Ship Rock with uh, Rob Hart on the left and Jim, and we're sorting gear. 
and we did sh ship rock in 1986. It was only slightly illegal to do it. <laughs> so here is, uh, whoops, let's go back. Sorry about that, folks. I know this is kind of hard to look at when you're flopping around. Um, should go back. Should, so here's uh, Bivouac, we did high in the face. I'll just let it go out and cycle through here. There's Jim in 1977, at the time of the first attempt, there he is in the Tetons in 1978. So this is the base of the North Face. That was a horrible bivouac and the lightning and the, and the snowstorm. And that's trying to get off the next day and getting up down there you can see the winds blowing and we have bongs for Tetons, not friends yet. So this corresponds, I think it's chapter 19, called A Ticket to Ride. And this is, this is a good story. This is actually on the successful attempt, you know, just kind of starting to get into the thick of things here. And uh, so when we drove uh, up from Red Lodge and, and, and uh, uh, Bozeman, we knew that there had been some snow in the mountains. And uh, we were kind of nervous about that. We thought, oh man, are we going to go up there and get aced again? And we were on the on this face four different times, and I think we drove up there two other times where we went, no, nah, I don't think, you know, the weather isn't gonna hold. I don't think we should do it, and we drive back. But uh, on this one, we the only place you can see the north face of Saya from a road in Glacier that I know of is right near the Ampkins Station in Dominion Glacier. There's, it just appears up that drainage that Cracker Lake is in, and you can see it. And we looked at it, and sure enough, I had snow on that, and I was just kicking around, you know, kind of moaning, and, probably cussing this morning a little bit too. And I said, oh geez, what do you think? Three days to let it dry a little bit? And Jim was sitting there looking through his binoculars. I mean, this is detail in the book. You'll probably remember this part. He's squinting through these binoculars and he's not responding to me. And he goes, you know what, Kennedy? I think we have a ticket to ride. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I don't think there's that much snow up there. But he said, you know what that means? We're not gonna have to carry much water. And I went, oh yeah. So up we went. So the, you can see this is very glass. This is ice, and we were climbing with uh, you know fingerless gloves, and it was horrible putting your hands in that stuff. But the steeper it got, the less there was of it. So it worked out. So this is in the traverse in the diorite, moving from left to right. So this photo, this is a good one to tell uh, more story on this. This is on the successful attempt in '79. And this is the first day. I led all the pitches except for one on the first day, and Jim led all the pitches except for one on the second day. And no, that's not sunlight. Uh, that's just the white rock above the diorite sill, which is right here. So we got up to here and traversed right for about two pitches and then went up the rest of the line. So in 1978, we had this attempt where we had the high winds, and it was windy, the sky was gray, it was really intimidating. It just had a creepy feel to it, and I was at this point. I was I always led this pitch, and uh, I was up there, and, and and I looked up, and it was just procrastinating, just not really liking it. And I saw this speck against the sky. I should have made this black, and it would have been more realistic. And I looked at it, and uh, I thought, gosh, it's a raven stalled in the uh, in the wind, and, and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I thought. God, maybe it's an eagle diving down there. And I went, no, it's a rock. It's a rock about you know, maybe half the size of this piano. And uh, coming down, and, and I describe in the book, you know, the sound it made went over our heads. And it probably went off my right shoulder over, over our heads and went past Jim and crashed on a ledge, you know, probably about 30 feet from him. And that, we called it a day after that point. I mean, the wind would blow so hard, it was blowing scree off the ledges. So I guess it wasn't surprising that something would come down here. One other little vignette on this, you know, uh, there's been several base jumps off the edge of, of Saya down the face. There's been one successful wingsuit. If you know what a wingsuit is, you know, you just, you just cruise. You don't, you don't throw a chute until you get near the bottom, you throw a chute to land. I didn't do it. A friend I know, Jeff, did it, and I saw his video of it. They made a pretty good video from the ground and from the summit, and it's just like mind-boggling. This is the route he flew down. So it, this is steep enough for somebody to wingsuit off of it. And Jeff flew, he said, for 33 seconds. And there was a rumor that the first ascent party left a, uh, a 
cowbell somewhere up in the face. This would be my favorite picture, and it's going to go away pretty fast, but it's out of focus, unfortunately. So we had these rolling 90s, and you had to guess at the, uh, at the depth of field and the focus, and we're in dim light, and we just kept it on infinity, because after about 20 feet, it's all the same anyway. And I was closer than 20 feet, but I just thought that was a fabulous photograph. Uh, and this is, uh, should have dissolved, but let's, let's go back. Uh, this is going to go away fast, but this is where we would bivouac tie in the face. And not on this little pedestal, but on the wall just behind Jim. So we spent a, a night there. And that was a spectacular night because it was, it was pretty warm for being up in the mountains like that. And I was all snuggled into my down parka. And uh, this is one of my favorite wilderness wild experiences ever. I mean, you're sitting there and you're captivated and captured. You're captured because you're tied into the wall behind you with two feet of rope and captivated because, you know, I never sleep in bivouacs and just, you're sitting there for 11 hours just waiting for it to get light. But that night it was, it was easy pickings. Uh, There's just a little bit of wind that dripped in from the left, dripped in from the right, a little bit of updraft. And you just look out and crack the lake is right at your feet. And this is uh, Mount Allen. Oops, sorry, wrong button. Oh, here we go. Um, let me back up. I just have to tell the story. Now it's going forward. There we go. And so uh, Mount Allen would be probably over in here. Wilbur's over here. This is probably part of the garden wall over here. So uh, Gould's probably there. And then Merritt's over here. Cleveland's over there. And uh, uh, Chief Ons were there, and the only sign of humans was probably a few lights from Cardston. No truck traffic, no jets, no gunshots, no other people, you know, hanging in their portal edges <laughs> next to you that you could converse with. It was just nothing, and, and I just thought it was the coolest thing, having your back against the wall. And so ever since then, I have had this, you know, Diane and I, when we go out on outings, we always try to lay down at least for five minutes with just your back against the earth. And that is really a great wild experience, especially if you can't detect other humans. So I'm always seeking solitude around Bozeman, and it can be done if you go find game trails and go hither and yon. You can, you can get away from it. And, you know, it's, it's just, to me, that's my coolest wild experience now. I still like to climb, but I like going out by myself and, and just putting my back against the ground. Okay, all right, projector, now go forward. There we go. And so you've probably seen this in the book. This is on what we call the catwalk. We're taking a calorie break. We're five pitches below the top, and Jim decided to take a selfie, and I didn't know what a selfie was. I don't think Jim did either. He says, here, let's take a picture of both of us. And I, and I was thinking, oh, this is gonna work. Don't waste the frame on this. So I had a twist tie in my mouth. If I would have known it would have looked like that, I would have taken it out. Thomas Torriano, who wrote the book, uh, uh, Select the Peaks of the Greater Yellowstone, which is a, a collector's item, a fabulous book. It's a guidebook, but it's a history, and it sold out within months, and it probably cost a zillion dollars to produce it, but he is working on another issue. He said he wanted to put this one in the book. I said, you know, do you think you could Photoshop that out? And he says, nah, he says, I think it's better with, with it. Th this sweater is my first polyester pile garment. My mom made it. I went down to Melby's Flathead Furniture in Columbia Falls and bought two yards of carpet, what is it, carpet padding or carpet something or other, and that, that was the buzzword. It's like if you, if you can't find one, you know, and you can make one, get carpet padding. And this was a fabulous, fabulous sweater, it was so warm, but my, my mom, Betty, bless her heart, she made that for me in 1978. Just another hero shot there. Th this picture was not the hardest place, but it was a steep place, and it was a really nice photograph. So this is the catwalk, five pitches below the top, and that's where the catwalk is. And at that point, we kind of we, we knew it, we had it in hand. That is probably the toughest pitch. That was a really scary pitch on that. And, and so here's the sound we got up there just before uh, sundown on our last day, on our second day. And then we bivouacked again. We didn't want to go down to walk out Cracker Lake, so we just hung out again one more day. And so this is in Red Lodge, the monastery. So there's a, a, whoops, I keep hitting the wrong button. That's not the projector, it's me. It's supposed to go backwards. Go backwards. Okay, 
So this is the monastery. It was a, it was a house that Jim Kanzler bought in Red Lodge for twelve thousand dollars in about 1972 or something like that. And this is uh, my bachelor's party. I'm at the wedding rehearsal, and I just have to go through these people. I'll do a little name dropping here, but. This is Jack Tackle, this is Dan Hogan, this is Rick Hooven, who was from California and he was a Yosemite climber. He climbed with guys like Bridwell and John Long and people like that. And he was a fabulous climber. He made the third descent of the shield. That's his girlfriend back there. The, the women weren't supposed to be at the bachelor's party, so they kind of peeked out from behind. <laughs> this is Mark Kalatowski, who was in the USGS Geological Survey, um, probably is close to retirement now. Uh, this is Craig Zaspel, who was uh, just retired as a professor of uh, physics and astrophysics at University of Montana Western. Jim Emerson right behind him. Gary Scar, who's about my age, introduced tackle to climbing in the early 70s. He still climbs hard. Uh, and this is his brother, who I don't know. And this is Jim Williams, who's a world-renowned guide. He's guided all the, I don't know, how many continents are there? Seven, eight, nine, I can't remember. He's done them all. He's climbed Everest himself and uh, Vincent in Antarctica and guided a lot of parties and just had a lot of, uh, just a, a fantastic business of, you know, not necessarily him guiding, but he had the guides too and, and you know, people went around the world up in the mountains with him. This is Doug McCarty, who had a PhD from Dartmouth, uh, clay mineral scientist, had one of the greatest uh, clay minerals uh, labs in the world, according to uh, people. People from Russia came in and they were trying to figure out how to get to the oil, that kind of thing. But, you know, he still lives in Bozeman, does a lot of downhill skiing, and this is the un incomparable Brian Leo, who I like to introduce him as a guy that saved my li life twice in one day uh, when I took that long fall. And I wasn't really hurt bad. We walked out. So this is in Alaska with Jim Kenzer's son, Jamie. Yeah, I knew that it was going to do that. I should have hung on it longer. But that was J.P. Gambatis on the left and Jamie in the middle and myself. And if you go back to here, this is at the landing strip. There's the summit of Denali back there. The landing strip's at, what, 7,000 feet, I think, and the summit's 20,000 feet. So when we flew in with Doug Gating in 1992, so with J.P. and uh, uh, and Jamie Kanzler, Gating, who, he agreed to try to fly past the peak we're going to do. So this is the southeast face, the east Kahuna peak. It's contiguous with uh, Denali. So it's a satellite peak of Denali. <clears throat> Excuse me, of Denali. So you can see the wing of the airplane there and a tie down. And, and we're, we're lower than the summit of the peak, I think. And he just ran out of glacier. He says, okay, I'm going to have to turn it around now. And I looked out and like the glacier's like 20 feet below us. And he's turning the airplane around. I go, oh my God, I'm not going to get out of here. So we decided to try this s cool art thing. We thought, well, that'd be a good shakedown because the real route we wanted to do is this thing over here. And we did this route and the weather changed when we got up there and we thought, you know, maybe we better dig a snow cave. And then the weather didn't turn out to be that bad. So the next day we thought, well, we could go to the top and back. We'd probably enough, have enough fuel to, to make water or we can just go back. Our base camp's probably down in here off the photo a little bit and rest up and go have it this thing. But as it turned out, avalanche conditions were really horrible. And I'll point it out why that was in, in another frame here. So we made it one last attempt up here and that's when Jamie kicked loose a slab that was probably two feet thick and, oh, I don't know, probably a, a, you know less than half the size of this room, but it was big enough and I got gobbled up by a crevasse before I got to JP and I. We didn't understand what happened until we got up there and went, uh oh. And so we turned around not long after that. We probably turned around right around in here. It's probably just off the train a little bit. And then the next year, Pat and I went up with perfect conditions. This is what it looks like when the middle guy in, in the rope falls through a hidden crevasse. You don't want to go out on those glaciers unroped. And so JP went in, and I detailed the whole rescue operation in, 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 in the last chapter. And you can see surface fork crystals, look at, look at this. I mean, and you couldn't even see where, there was just a little bit of mist on the glacier, you couldn't see where your feet were going. And we had already walked over something just like this. And the second one ate JP there. And he just went through like he dropped through a manhole cover. And uh, he was at least 15 feet down. Uh, 
you know, I could just barely see the top even when I got to here. So you have to come out on a second rope that is padded because the first rope digs in and you can't do more acoustic out of it. So you have to have a padded rope. So he's already switched his, his gear from this rope to this rope and could get out and we we're all really happy. He was in the hole about 50 minutes and it could have been a lot worse. And JP was holding him on in self-arrest for 50 minutes and it was just killing him. Um, but it had been a really cold winter and a dry winter and I think all this surface for formed on the other side of the snow bridges and they were very weak and it just took his body weight to blow it uh, wide open and I had to go from the other side over here to this side to you know start orchestrating a rescue and that was really hairy because I, yeah, I knew I was going over the same caress but I, I didn't know what was below me and I, I got on my belly and just crawled and, and drug my pack behind me to lessen the weight and as it turned out I got over without much problem but the whole anchor was a buried pack. I knew I couldn't get ice screws. I knew I couldn't get other gear in there because the rock, we already knew the surface was pretty rotten. And so I just grabbed the shovel and started digging as deep as I could through the pack in there and he drew my arm out on a, on a buried pack. But being the young guys, they wanted to keep going. So up we went after that, shook it off and up we went. And I'm like, oh my God. So, um, this is a picture of Jamie in the Narrows. Now this next picture is brand new. That's Jamie's son, Dylan Kanzler, and I wish I could have stopped in that frame. I don't think I'll be able to do that. He made the World Cup Tour this year, 18 in freestyles, or uh, slope style skiing. He didn't make the Olympic team, but he was on the World Cup Tour, which is pretty amazing. So that's a fourth generation of Kanzler. Hal, Jim and Jerry, Jamie, and James Dillon, named after Bob Dillon, of course. And uh, so here's the route that Pat and I wound up doing in perfect conditions the following year. So we had the same problem. We got up to here and all of a sudden the, the, the peak got into, the base got into sunlight. And it was just like a continuous flow of cornflakes down this uh, uh, ice gully. And uh, we kept thinking, boy, something big's gonna come down here. So we went over here and hung out for a number of hours. And it was about 11 pitches up to here. And, and this is 2,000 feet up to here. So it's very foreshortened. So this, this is about the halfway point right in here. And we thought we were gonna have to bivouac in some narrow little thing here. But as it turned out, when we got up there, well, that's Pat coming up that. That actually made it to the Alpine Journal. And this is where we came up. And we had this big flat spot right here that we could bivouac on. We didn't even put in anchors. But the story here is, it, it was warm and I was leading this, you know, pitch of uh, water ice, probably a smattering of water ice for it, but it was really wet, like, you know, it can be even in the middle of the winter, but this is probably wet from sun on it. And I got these bib knickers really wet and I wasn't in a place where I could stop and put on shells. We were climbing without shells, it was warm enough. And so I got up there and we bivouacked here uh, when it got dark and I thought, geez, I can't wear these wet things all night. So I took them off and I, we laid on ropes and I put these, these are my bib knickers, I put it on my rope to help insulate it. Well, the next morning they're so stiff I couldn't even unfold them. <laughs> so I thought, if I can't unfold it, I'm not taking my boots off and trying to put on these frozen things. So I left them there. That's, that's your final resting place. So I did the rest of the climbing, two pairs of long underwear and, and, and wind pants. So here we are in the upper part of the face. It was pretty easy going to start with because the snow was so receptive to crampons in your ice axis. But I think this is the point where it turned to blue ice. So I probably put in a couple of anchors right here in Toronto, took a quick picture of Pat, but we're both just dragging a rope. I'm dragging a rope, he's dragging a rope. And then we you know, regrouped here and started blame from there on out. But here's where we came up and here's where we bivouacked. Now little dot right there are my big knickers. <laughs> And so on the way down, we wound up digging a snow cave. It was so windy, we couldn't get a stove lit and it was getting late and we were pretty trashed. And so we dug a snow cave. And, and then we waited about six hours for the snow to get frozen again. So we could go over the crevasses with less intrepidation. It would be really serious for one guy to fall in with only one guy. Uh, so we climbed with our tools, clipped to our harnesses and had ice screws just in case he went in to try to get the weight off the guy that caught you. But fortunately, we never fell in. Honestly, I think the best number of people for a rope on a glacier 
or at least four. I fell through a crevasse on uh, Mount Logan in the Yukon, and uh, I was the 25th man crossing this crevasse, the lightest guy, we were on our way out. I, had a, I was on a rope team of five, and I blew through it, and I wound up 15 feet down. And, uh, but it was pretty straightforward getting out, no injuries, fortunately. But part of the reason was we had a lot of other people to hold it. One guy holding somebody else in a crevasse is not much fun at all. So this is the base of the west face of, um, of Mount Cleveland. So you can see what a parabolic mirror this is. That's what Bob Frost called it. And this isn't really a fish light. This is probably a 35 millimeter lens, might even be a 50, which would be a normal lens. So where I'm standing here is probably where Jim Anderson's camera was discovered, right, right in this area somewhere in here, and was right in here somewhere where Pat found the pack on the way down. Jim and Peter Lev and Pat were way, way up in here somewhere in a snow cave, and uh, they, they couldn't find him, but they could see the avalanche, but they couldn't sign, see me sign him, so they thought this didn't involve them until they got all the way down to here. And in the book, I described this, and I talked to Pat about this, you know, numerous times throughout the years that we've climbed together. And he said, uh, yeah, I just looked out into the snow and there was something that just didn't look right. So the traverse kind of goes, oh, this is horizontal. It doesn't really look I like it. And then you can go all the way out this way. And that's what we did with the Glacier Mountaineering Society in 2018. It was more horizontal looking than this parabolic mirror, but you cross it. And we got out here, went up the West Rib, and it was pretty straightforward to get into the summit. But those guys fell out of the avalanche above this waterfall. There's a, there's a pocket there, and then all the liner debris went down. And, you know, the Park Service really didn't, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a tough ball game for those guys. And this is kind of the last slide. Um, I'm not sure what time we're getting to here. I, can't, I thought I could see 8.20. Well, we've already gone over an hour. But just, just a couple of parting comments here. It was really an international effort. The Canadians helped immeasurably. Uh, there's a book called Guardians of the Peaks, the history of uh, uh, mountain rescue in the Canadian Rockies, and they have a lot bigger terrain and a lot more of it to cover. And those guys are something special. And even they had just assembled that team when, when this occurred. And those guys came from Jasper and Revelstoke. And in the book, it says this probably was the greatest international effort of any rescue ever. And I thought, yep, I bet they're right. So anyway, um, we'll just let this cycle through. This is my mantra when I go into the, into the mountains. There's the uh, original cover and then the new cover. And that's the end of the slideshow. Sorry it took so long. to ask. If you don't feel brave enough to ask it from back there, come on up. Oh, oh, if you stand up and raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone to you. If anybody has any questions? Anyone? Mueller? Anyone? Mueller? That's a, that's Bueller? It's, Bueller? Oh. Yeah, from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Oh, okay. <laughs> I missed that one. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, or feel free to come up too. I know it's kind of hard to ask a question from way back. I'm sure, you know, people would have some questions. Probably most of them would be answered in the book. There's a lot of different little vignettes in the, in the book too. Uh, and just about everything I spoke of here would, would be in that book. I do have a question back here, Terry. Okay, good, yes. Terry. Years ago, you spoke in Columbia Falls. And you said uh, your dad start planning always said you had something to know do you remember what your dad said yeah I, I mean it, yes it was in Columbia Falls and it was actually well uh, Barry Frost and I were gearing up to go try an attempt on the north face of Cleveland which fortunately we never really got very far up the mountain before it rained but my dad was out there and, and when they found out that we were actually going for the north face we tried to keep it under wraps you know, everybody just kind of went, whoa, wait a minute here. And my dad says, well, one thing I've always liked knowing about you, son, you always know when to turn back. And that, that was the quote. 
And and we went, God, I mean, I, I've never even thought about that before. It's like, yeah, I guess we could turn back if things got too bad. But that, that, was, that was his quote. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Come on, somebody's got a fire one up here. Otherwise, you're, you're certainly welcome to come up and further uh, conversation, look at the history of, you know, kind of the progression of ISAC's development and look at a couple of relics. This is the pack, right? Oh, yeah, let's, the... let me get that. I have a question. Yes. Um, Use the microphone so everyone can hear. Terry, uh, what do you think the technical difficulty was on, like, Sai or Cleveland? Like, the yeah. Kanzler pitch at the top, yeah. just like grade-wise. Right. You know, I, Jim and I talked about that, and sometimes it's kind of hard to tell, especially when you climb into the pack. Of course, the leader had a light pack, and that's why, you know, one guy would lead all one day with the light pack, and the other guy would follow with the heavy pack. Uh, so we, we got back and discussed it, and we figured we were climbing about 5982, um, and but we were in boots and with a pack, and 59. You know, when it got worse than that, you couldn't afford to fall. So you were grabbing gear if you had to. You just cannot fall up there. And so, and we never did take a fall. And uh, so I think we were climbing free up to about 5'9", probably. I know subsequent parties did it all free and climbed at 5'10", which seems pretty reasonable. The amount of aid we did, I think we figured we did some aid on about seven pitches. But the most we ever did consecutively today was maybe 40 feet in that picture you saw Jim Kanzler towards the end. That was pretty gnarly. So, and that was scary because he didn't have any gear in for about 20 feet. And then, then it got too hard to climb free with boots and a pack. So he started aid climbing and that would be a not a good time to pop a piece of gear. You know, you go past the layer and who knows how it turned out. But, Probably 5982 is what we called it, and, and probably it was really 5981. The rock really accepts pitons really well, and, and of course, friends and all the rest of it too. So, you know, the protection wasn't that hard. You know, you had to really, you know, scrutinize what it was going into, but uh, there was a lot of available protection. Apparently, there wasn't on that pitch, though. Question down here? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, on these details, details I do, I started writing this book a long time ago, so I had a lot of it already down, but um, yeah, some of the, that's the beauty, and that's kind of the wild experience, too, is these experiences are so intense, you, you really forget the highlights of it, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Mount Cleveland thing, I mean, there probably isn't a day go by that I don't think about it. You know, and I served for six years every day. I mean, it was like brushing my teeth. You know, it's like, we're gonna go get this thing. And and uh, and then on to Saya. It was kind of an extra quote of Jim Kanzler at the top of, uh, of Cleveland. You know, we were all really psyched up. We weren't thinking too much about the tragedy until we got further down. And you probably know that from reading the book, but uh, he looked around and he says, okay, what's next? You know, and I went, well, I've been looking at Saya and he said, Let's go do it, you know, and, and so, you know, it took four years to get it, yeah. So, but, yeah, you, know, you do remember these details, and, you know, we probably all have experience that we can re remember every minute detail, but, yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I don't think I'm a savant, but I've been called an idiot a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody Is that else? Still there? Uh, I'm sorry? Is that cowbell still there? As far as I know, but you know, that Webby may have brought it up by now. You know, we actually, it was hung from a piton there. We didn't leave it on a piton. We found a, uh, you know, a little stop a rock and loop the runner around it because we needed the piton later. But, you know, I, I don't know why we hung it from that piton, but we certainly didn't waste the piton just hanging the cowbell on it. But as far as I know, the cowbell is still up there somewhere. More cowbell. <laughs> Pardon? More cowbell. More cowbell. Yeah, hopefully it's ringing up there somewhere, but. You know, someday maybe somebody will find it. That, that, that was a really good question down here. Anybody else, something similar to that or technical stuff? Go ahead. So 
if you were able to choose your favorite climb, what would it be and why? Oh boy, that, that's a tough one. If, if you're talking about Glacier Park, of course, Saya was good because it was it was a big deal, and 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 in the time we did it, we knew we were going to get it from the start. We knew we had the weather, and we were just we were a pretty well oiled machine at that point, and we just thought, just don't make any stupid mistakes, and we're going to get this thing this time. And so that was a favorite. But my favorite climbing glacier for the quality of the rock, <laughs> the ambience, and all the rest, it was probably the west, west face of Saint Nick. It's the best rock I've been on in Glacier, and I don't know why it's better than the rest of it, but it was, and that was that was was great. And we were really young and picked off something, and it was pretty cool. But other than that, I don't know. It's you know, it's always the last one you did. Really, was your favorite? <laughs> yeah, these are really good questions. I really, really appreciate it. If anybody else wants to ask, you know, some. How many people are here that have been on Mount Cleveland? So summit in Cleveland. Wow, look at that. You guys have all summited Cleveland? Yeah. That's amazing. That's really exciting. So what? Look at what you did. Well, yeah, I know, but it, it's all good. Uh, did you do the West Face or the uh, Stony Indian Traverse? Or? Stony Indian in the West Face. I haven't done the Stony Indian, but I'd really like to do it. And I think that an easy way to get up there and find that last cliff band where I think the Cleveland Five went through there would be Stony Indian and just below 10,000 feet, try to traverse straight over to it and then up. And then you could go back Stony Indian again. I, I actually tried to go in there a couple of years ago and I just got rained out. It's the most rain I've ever experienced in the mountains over two days. It was just horrible. And uh, I pitched my tent on thimble berries and the tent never even reached the ground. <laughs> it, it was just pathetic, but so I didn't get my chance at Stony Indian. But, that's a good question. And show it again, the hands. How many people did Stony Indian? Wow, yeah, that's a good route. And then how many people did uh, the West Face then? The West Face is nothing to sneeze at. I mean, it's serious. You, you're, you're a long ways from anywhere when you get on there. You, 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 gotta, be, you gotta be careful what you're doing up there. So that's, that's very impressive. Uh, that's a really good question. That, that's a nice stat to know. Anybody else? Roger Newman, I'm, I'm, I should think you would have a question. <laughs> One more question over here. Do you have any idea how many repeats there have been on North Face of Cleveland North Face? Yeah, and that is an excellent question. I gotta tell you this, that um, Mon the North Face of Cleveland, after the Cleveland tragedy, had two ascents up to the 800 foot ledge, that big ledge that traverses across. One was solo by a guy named, uh, um, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. The other one was by that group of guys from Minnesota that Brian, I think, Brian Kennedy tracked down and their names are in the more, most recent uh, guidebook. But the upper head wall hadn't been climbed. And when we got up there, I could understand why. And uh, so I think it, has, it was climbed by Kenny Castleder and is it Mark Brown? did an ascent in 1991 of the North Face. But those are the, you know, and they did the whole thing. And I, I don't know of, there might have been a sense since, but I'm not aware of it. But uh, Gordon, uh, Don Clunch, Gordon Clunch, Don Clunch from Seattle. He saw the Wishbone Ridge on, um, um, on Mount Robson. And we went up to Mount Robson and walked over and looked at the, at the Wishbone Ridge one time, and, and we looked at it, and I thought, man, you have got to be kidding me. And uh, fortunately, it snowed a foot that night, so we didn't even have to try it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, he was he just passed away recently, and I guess he was a, a physicist or a mathematician, I can't remember which, but boy, talk about bold. Yeah, I mean, that would be very committing. Um, so that's, that's all I know, and, and I think Sai has had at least three ascents on it. Two of my, I think a guy named Dan Wood, he, is Dan Wood here tonight? No, um, from Whitefish, I think, the last time I heard, it's been a while, and uh, he was just a, you know, high caliber climber, and, and uh, he, d he did it twice, and once with uh, Kelly Quarters, I think, and those guys are just really high caliber modern climbers. So I think Asias had 
one, two, three, a sense of kind of the route we did, and another sent off to a, a rib to the left. It doesn't go quite to the summit, but it's still a very serious terrain. Anybody else? You know, I've got the, you know, some of the old gear here, so you can saunter out, and, uh, oh, here, here's the pack. This was Jerry Kanzler's pack that was recovered off of Mount Cleveland, and uh, it's a caramel. It's made mostly out of canvas uh, felt, but you can see one shoulder strap is completely missing, just completely evolved off of it. And I'm not sure if this is trauma or if this is actually rodent, you know, it being up there for a while, the rodents drew down. Oh, by the way, and I filled it out. This is one of the ropes that we used in our North Face of Cleveland just for effect, but. Um, I do have uh, several other things. I don't know if that you're interested in macabre things like that, but I thought this was pretty impressive. And, and uh, Jim gave it to me when his mom moved into assisted living. She had uh, in her shed a whole bunch of memorabilia, and this this was part of it. This is Kennedy you take it. Terry, great stories. Yeah, great yeah. photos. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Bring your books up.